We were called up when we had a really bad snowstorm. I couldn't even get there on my own. My husband had to take me to the shelter. I think it was Hurricane Isabel, and uh, we were called on to open a shelter at that point. I guess it was about seven years ago when we had the big snow and all the electricity went out. Large brush fires, which then evacuated the area, and there were homes that were not safe to stay in. It was a, a couple of floods that we had to help a couple of towns to prep for. Say maybe 15 years ago, there was an apartment complex fire. And there were 60 individuals displaced. Unfortunately, uh, mass shooting events are uh, a reality of American life. The down trees and power lines made the roads impassable. Anything from a hurricane to tornadoes to maybe a spill. Uh, derailment that happened up in Saskatchewan in Canada. The, the potential terrorist attack. Apartment fires that have led to shelters. Then of course the hurricane and the tornado shelters. Any of those things in Virginia you could see. Disaster comes in many forms. Natural disasters, which are uh, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, and then man-made. So what typically constitutes a shelter being needed is an event that drives individuals out of their normal place of shelter. In a sheltering strategy, you're gonna look at the different types of reasons for having a shelter in place. In Virginia, about any type of disaster could lead to a shelter. Because it's not if it's going to happen, it, and we've all heard this, it is when, right? Um, and we'd be silly uh, and naive to think that it's not going to happen here. There's a variety of agencies, departments, organizations um, that will be part of the decision-making that goes into whether a shelter is necessary. And so when you look at your first responders, your police officers, your fire department personnel, your ambulance authorities, they're gonna be the ones that arrive on a scene first and realize how many individuals may be in need. Once that activation is requested, it's a variety of individuals, departments, agencies, partners, uh, uh, both internal and external to a locality that make that plan happen. Well, as uh, the Department of Social Services, we are required to staff the shelter. So when a shelter is called for, we're the ones who get probably the third call. How many of you interview clients on a regular basis, day to day? investigate their needs, the resources that they require to support their ongoing life, right? That's why social services is requested to manage and, and lead the sheltering efforts. It's because we have the experience of interviewing people, identifying who they are, and evaluating the resources that they need to support them. This is no different than a daily workday. We take care of clients, we answer their issues, we try to help them as much as we can, and we refer them to where they need to go. It's no different. When you look at it, it is a huge project, but it's broken down into bits and pieces where it's handleable. The reality is that because it is such a large undertaking, um, the city doesn't really have the internal personnel to do it all alone. We have to depend on a vast variety of uh, partnerships uh, that exist within the city, within the region, uh, and even across the state and nation. And you can't make those calls cold. The time to make the call and ask for support isn't after the tornado has come through, it's long before any bad weather even approaches an area. 
So what's happening behind the scenes to prepare for these things are, are a couple of things is logistics and exercises. Logistics is a large component of emergency management itself. The other huge one is exercises. Um, our morning is going to be full of four different workshops. Uh, you will rotate in groups of approximately 10, uh, about every 40 minutes. Anything you want to input that we want to capture, improve, update in our, in, you know, our shelter operations. I do think that um, it would be helpful to shear up the language and the interpretation services. Charging stations, so like having enough chargers where that could be a rapid charging station for folks. Specific things that you're talking about, that we don't come up with that by planning on PowerPoints. We have to do this exercise to do that. Well, the training just gives you an overview of what happens when a shelter is um, activated, which is very good information to have, especially if you don't know and you're walking into this for like the first time, you kind of get an idea of what's going to happen. The impacts of fill are expected to continue through Thursday night. We're expecting three to seven more inches of rain, um, causing flash flooding, fallen trees, and potential landslides. exercises is not just you know knowing where to sit and where to go it's establishing those relationships and establishing those things that are very very important being able to communicate with those agencies and talk to those individuals about their resources how we can partner and the number one goal is to support the shelter and the individuals in those shelters, I think it's a phenomenal thing when you have all of those agencies to come together and support the shelter effort. So some things to expect um, when you're opening, when you're going to a shelter or when, when a shelter has been ordered. It's not going to be like some huge disaster movie, okay? It's, um, it's something where there's partners there, we're all working together. There's a lot of people that are involved in this shelter. And so it must be really daunting when you get the call and you have to figure out, you have to change your plans, what are you going to do with your kids? And you think, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? I think one of the things I would tell anybody that's going into an emergency shelter for the first time live is to not panic. You're not by yourself. The goal for everyone there is to assist and meet the needs. So if you ever feel like you're running short, we've made sure you got backup. You've got support. My perception was when I was thinking about shelter, I was like, oh, Okay, what do I have to do? It's going to be uh, demanding on me. Am I going to have to stay up? And you know, but actually, they have a great process. You know, it's not going to be so much on one person. So somebody's walking through the door. It's it's a bad day for them, right? Uh, nobody wants to come and sleep on a gymnasium floor. Nobody wants to be pushed out of their houses due to an emergency, whether it's a tree that falls in their home, um, an extended power outage that they're experiencing, um, a tornado takes it off its foundation. They're coming to a, a space like this because they have to. Well, there's not a lot of things that are different between how you would react and how they're reacting. What's on your mind would be on their mind. So it's recognizing that, it's looking at them in a very person-centered way, uh, and then making that connection, getting a smile. Being able to help everybody understand that we've all had this experience, so that brings a commonality to all of us, that also, even a person who's experienced this devastation still does have compassion within them for someone else who's also had that experience. So that's one of those innate things that the human experience thrives on. I like to think of keeping customer service in mind. And if you were in a shelter in that situation, what would you want done for you? So the, one of the best things that shelter staff can do is help people take care of basic needs and create an environment that's predictable, manageable, and controllable.
And that's managing transition. That's letting people know about what to expect, what they can expect from this inevitably a chaotic situation. We want to create as much peace and predictability with that. We want to let people know where the resources are. Keeping people informed about how the event is unfolding or how long the operations is going to be taking place. It's best practice to be able to coordinate and identify with your manager, you know, what is the briefing schedule going to be and to let your clients know uh, what that schedule is going to be so they can anticipate. Um, today we're having a resident briefing. It's a little past 11. Um, at 11.30, the uh, children's activity area will be closed and we'll be serving lunch at 12. We will have a shift change after the lunch shift. Um, so you'll be seeing some new faces in here, but we'll make sure you get to know them. You know, we as people generally like routine. We like the predictable. And that's why it's so important in shelters that like meal times are posted and followed because you're trying to build that sense of routine back for people, that comfort that comes from knowing what comes next. But routine, when we're talking about lights on, lights off, you know, having a strict schedule is really important for people just to be accustomed to it. Collecting resources and contacts is also extremely helpful. We usually have a huge board, multiple pages of local resources, including mental health, social services, local hotels, local volunteer agencies, anything that we can collect so that we can share that with families. We put up signage, so we want everybody to, to not have to wonder where to go to get to anything. You'll see signs that direct you to the bathrooms and signs that direct you to the showers and to where you can get food and to where the actual area is where you'll be abiding for the night. And I know one of us was talking earlier today about even in an actual shelter having like a map of where all the places are and maybe even just a large one posted, you know, where the residents can see it. You just need to know where your supports are. So when I'm talking about the supports, I'm talking about your mental health providers, your medical providers, your local law enforcement providers, or if somebody has a support animal, it could be from animal care and control. The definition in, in, for a disaster shelter is a safe environment, and you can only do that if you're um, keeping a watchful eye and making sure that the people in your care are cared for. My recommendation would never open a shelter unless you've got a resource for security. Best practices would be to have a law enforcement uh, representative there at your shelter. But in reality, based on the size of the event and how it's impacting the community, they may be stretched. So you want to be able to make sure that you're observing the people that are in the shelter to see if you see anything that looks like it's changing from when they came into the shelter that maybe looks like it might escalate. If something doesn't seem right, don't wait until it gets to a point where it's escalated. Go ahead and let your manager know. They will share that information with the Emergency Operations Center, and the Emergency Operations Center will get a law enforcement officer dispatched there to help with that particular situation. You're trying to protect the masses. You're trying to create a safe environment for all in your care. You know, when there are a lot of people close together, it's important to be situationally aware of what's going on around you. If you go in there with that mindset, you know, that you are paying attention, you're really observing what's going on, you're able to help the person that's in the shelter, and you're also supporting your team. And when you're paying attention to your clients, and you're paying attention to your coworkers and the partner, all the teams, that just makes for a strong shelter, and that's how we get through a disaster. You know, these people are coming in, they're upset, they may have lost everything. Um, it's our job as shelter workers to make sure that there's an attitude of calm and we're gonna get through this together. If you can establish that comfort zone right up front, it can make their stay in the shelter go so much more smoothly. Working in a shelter means that 
primarily more than anything else is to be able to feel the pain or be empathetic of the people that are walking through the door. Um, it, Cause it, at some point it might just be you. Every aspect of life while these folks are in here, it has to be addressed because sheltering is all about teamwork. It's like running a small town, if you will, that you're recreating in a school gym. Last name? Ernest, E-R-N-E-S-T. Okay. I think the key to uh, success for anyone is understanding the population that you're serving once the operation starts. Uh, and that's, that's through the intake process. How many of you have filled out a form before? Not a shelter form, just any form, right? We all have, it's pretty simple. Intake is to basically get the necessary information to make sure that we're taking care of your needs. So at Intake, we take your name, your family. Medical information, remember that you need to ask them if they're experiencing anything, you know, behavioral health. Are they stressed, panic attacks, depression? Where they live, how to contact them, who their uh, emergency contacts are. Age, gender, family dynamic, if they seem to be demonstrating some signs and symptoms of an injury or an illness. Mental health support needs, counseling services, spiritual care. So it's almost like the get to know session. Thank you to have a seat over here so, so we don't have to talk so loud. My name is Jerry. I'm going to help get you registered. Can I get your first name? All right, I will tell you right now that the most important piece of information, the one we cannot live without, is a name. And the name of their family members with them. Why do you think the name is essential? That tells me how many cots I need, right? It's a head count. It tells me how many people staff I need. If we're serving 20 people, it's a big difference in our staffing numbers than if I'm serving 200 people. In intake drives so much. Intake drives the languages that you're going to need to have resources for in that environment. It's going to drive the number of cots and blankets and meals that you need to have in that environment. It's going to drive how many staff personnel Intake is really challenging because the individuals, they really don't want to answer those questions. They're frustrated. They're confused. When people come into intake, they're not entirely sure what they're checking themselves into, just as the intake worker may not feel confident. I, I think it's important that we are compassionate with the individuals to communicate with them why we need this information and the importance of it. Because we do need to know who you are. You're, we need to be able to track you. We understand why we need that information. And that's going to be a little challenging. So taking a few minutes to explain what's going to happen now that they've uh, arrived at the shelter is, is going to be extremely helpful. So, our registration form, which if you can share one of the registration forms in front of you, it looks like this. The paperwork is very important. Actually, one of the main objectives is to actually uh, be able to have documentation of what's taking place uh, within those particular areas. We need to know who they are, and it needs to be accurate. If people get separated, you can be able to get them back together with the right person. Sometimes when you're uh, operating in the shelter, you may be split up because somebody is in the area of um, you know, eating while somebody else is resting and then something happens and you need to get people back together. 
If you can prevent problems at the beginning, it's going to make your life so much easier. So make sure that the people that are doing intake really know to ask those good questions and get those good answers. The normal intake questionnaires don't say anything about animals. So if you have the chance and you remember, ask them the question, gather the information, write it down on their sheet, and talk to your shelter manager. Make sure they're aware of those needs. Some shelters don't take pets. So if a person shows up with their pet, but they're not allowed at that shelter, you need to know either where is the shelter you can send them to, or is there a place where you can send their pet to be cared for, because pet care is a family member. Having a more clear understanding on what to share with individuals who have that pet that they feel is a service, because like, the, the lady killed me with the spider, the service, uh, the service. <laughs> so you want to tell me about your pet? It's a service spider. A service spider. Never heard that, but I know it does happen that they feel that they should, should be service connected up animals. So, in front of you on the table, you will notice that we have a standard set of rules. These rules include no drugs, no alcohol, no firearms, no loud music, quiet times. After we finish the intake form, we want to review the rules. We want to post these all through the facility so that if somebody breaks the rules, we can refer back to them. Sheltering is a mass care operation. You're trying to deal with everyone on an equal level, but not everybody comes to the environment on, an, on equal footing. Intake at the beginning is going to be a busy place, right? We could get a bus of individuals and now we have 20 people to intake all at one time, or it could trickle in based on the type of an event that we are looking at. One of the main things is, as much as possible, the air of, of confidence and calmness, and recognizing that the people that you're gonna be dealing with are under increased amount of stress and duress. We wanna make sure that we strike up a conversation with everyone that registers into the environment. We're gonna find out potentially a lot of detail that we don't find out in intake through conversation. That's what you do more than anything, you listen. You, you need to get the information from them, but you need to listen. Oftentimes, you're the first person they've talked to. You wanna be welcoming in that it's, hey, how you doing? Can you sit right here and just spend a little time with me? I need to gather this information. And then we're gonna fill out some forms. So kind of explaining the things that you're gonna do um, with them and, and just tell them a little bit about the why. It's just unusual for everybody to be in a setting like that. And so we ask folks to put yourself in their place. If it was you and you had to come to a shelter, how would you want to be treated and treat people accordingly? But you're there to really be the ambassador uh, to that environment for that client uh, and, and make sure that the initial impression that they receive upon entry into that building is a positive one. To be able to, to, to you know, wrap somebody up in a blanket and say, you know, you're gonna be okay, you, this is a safe place, this is something that we can, we can make sure that nothing's gonna hurt you here. Um, that is invaluable in a, situ in a disaster situation. So I love the dormitory because it's the real heart of a shelter. You know, it's their living room, it's the family room. It's the bedroom. The dormitory area is some place where you are you're going to kind of mandate some ac action. Make sure that families are placed together. That single men are separate from single women are separate from family. You have an area for individuals that have medical essential equipment that needs electricity. So that we can kind of help to monitor and keep folks feeling comfortable even in this unusual place. 
You have to make sure you have an uh, adequate number of cots or beds for everybody. Um, make sure that each cot has its own sheets and pillow and it should be clean when you put it there. The word dormitory means people are sleeping. So people at rest are vulnerable. So it's essential that there's staffing within that environment to maintain oversight. There should always be someone in the dormitory area that a client can come to and ask a question of. Uh, there should always be somebody that if that client goes to eat a meal is going to stay there and safeguard their belongings. One of the hard and fast rules in the dormitory is it needs to be manned 24 seven, preferably with two people. tape is one of your best friends when you're in a shelter, so are Sharpies. I like to kind of at least mark off the aisles at the beginning, so I know we need to keep an aisle over there for the emergency exit free. I need to make sure I've got, you know, emergency exit to go over there. So if I can, I'm gonna use painter's tape because I don't want to strip the floor, but I might at least put the main aisles that I need to save for the emergency exits. You want to set it up so that people's feet are facing each other and the heads on the outside. And then you'd have your walking space between the heads, which would give you adequate space. So I'm a big believer in actually assigning cots. Like you don't just have them come in and they're like, pick a place. I also like to number the cots. So I like to have like A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And so then I'll get the names of the people and you can put it either on your registration form. Some people actually draw their own map. Usually when you're going to the shelter, it is obviously a need because nobody wants to go sleep on a cot with their 30 new closest roommates. It's a difficult situation. You're leaving your own home and your own possessions. You probably forgot things that you need and suddenly you're sleeping in a dormitory room. You've never done that before. Your children are uncomfortable. We want to support the families and their children, so we had games. Um, if there were individuals in the shelter that had expertise in nurseries or school children activities, I made sure that they were in that area and could support the families and their children because they don't understand what's going on. So we, we need to support our children. One of the expectations we have to set fairly early on is you are still responsible for your child. It doesn't matter that there are all these adults in the room. And we've had issues in some of our sheltering experiences where we've had to address that. In cases where there's enough space, one thing you really try to do is maybe set up a room where the kids can go and play if they have opportunity. And then hopefully you'll have a childcare area. Again, you have to have a diaper changing area, keep, keep a sink close by or hand sanitizer. Um, if they bring toys in, make sure that the toys stay with the individual children. You don't want them being spread around. Uh, have something set up where you can clean them off if you need to. And if it's a really big disaster, if lots of agencies are involved, there are other agencies that are involved in disaster that are authorized to do child care or child activities. We really want to make sure that we're giving people dignity and respect. The first, you know, day or two is really an adjustment to, you know, kind of what's, what are the rules of the road? What What is the... Uh, atmosphere in the shelter. And then it could also be that individuals are bringing in issues that they already had prior to coming to the shelter. So it's, I call it taking the temperature of the shelter. You know, you gotta know who your residents are. And again, that's us. You know, if I'm the shelter manager, sometimes what I do is I find my dormitory supervisor. I'm like, can you tell me what's going on in the shelter? What are the rumors? What's making people upset? 
you know, what am I looking at? What do you think we need to make people better? You know, and, and then we go from there. Every shelter has something that's challenging and unexpected. You'll never find one that's not. Some of the things that sometimes cause issues would be the fact that, you know, you tell people that their shelter is their current home. And what you do at home and find acceptable at home is not always what the person beside you finds acceptable. There was the elderly gentleman that at home, he walked around all the time in his underwear. And so that's what he was comfortable with and the shelter was his home. Not everyone else in the shelter felt that that was acceptable. When it comes to, to dormitory life and you have all these people in the gym someplace who are all sharing space together that have never shared space before. Um, uh, one of the things that I have found helpful many times is that while there are many different families and many different people represented. They're all there because they've experienced something in common. They've experienced the common disaster, whatever it was. You can use that to bring some commonality to the group to say, hey, we've all experienced this flood. We are all in a similar situation of loss and of devastation. So can we work together to make sure that by 1130 at night that we've all quieted down and if you need to take a phone call or you need to do something that you're able to step outside to be able to do that so that our families with children and, and others will be able to get them to rest. We're the ones everyone's gonna go to for information. They're gonna ask us probably because if you're in the dormitory, you're the ones that are gonna have probably the best relationship because you've taken the time to talk to them. You're the one they're gonna come to and ask questions when they think about it because they're hanging out in the dormitory because this is their living room. There are very few bright line rules in sheltering. The rest is figuring out what the best thing to do is under the circumstances with what you've got. One important thing to uh, remember when working in a dormitory environment is being a people person because this room is gonna be full of hundreds of people, all different types of attitudes. You have to always keep that smile on their face, no matter how tired you are. It's being people person and being very calm and always smiling at all times, even though it's a very bad situation. How can I help you do? You want me to sit up and play cards with you? I love to play cards. You want me to play cards with you? If you don't feel like going to sleep and it's lights out time, you know, so even during the dark times, you gotta find that little pinhole of light. Food service is important because you want to provide the nutrition that individual needs. What's significant to me as an emergency manager from a feeding perspective is to understand how many clients um, are in the shelter and what they're anticipated if they're going to stay in the shelter for you know, overnight or if they're just going to be there for a short term. That will help us work with our resources that will be able to come in and provide food to the shelter and to make those arrangements. We need to find out when, where, and how food is going to be prepared. Is it going to be prepared on site? Is it going to be brought in already prepared? How many people are there, which is why registration is important, so that you have an adequate amount of food for everybody who's there. Feeding is probably taking place, the pre preparation of the food is probably taking place off-site at a large-scale kitchen that then that food will then be brought to the shelter and then handed out there. So don't be surprised if at a shelter there isn't a feeding operation going on. But also know that if that shelter has been opened by the government or the Red Cross or whomever, that they've thought of feeding. You're, you're not gonna go hungry. Uh, there's a feeding plan in place even if you don't see the feeding plan. When we're out in a disaster situation, we'll have a, a freezer truck, we'll have a refrigerated truck, and what we call a dry box, which is not refrigerated at all. That's where the canned goods go, that's where the cambro, or the clamshells go, the cutlery is in there, 
and all of the supplies that we need. Meals are usually an eight ounce entree, six ounce vegetable, six ounces of fruit or pudding or something like that. So when that plan is put into place, there are many partners that, that come into play. There are some who provide the funding. There are some who then provide the product. There are some like our organization that provides the actual cooking equipment and the volunteers. Well, when it comes to the, the feeding part, we, we partner with the school and the cafeteria staff because they really don't want us in their kitchen messing around and we don't necessarily want to be in there either. So we all work together because it's a disaster and those of us that have done it many, many years, there isn't anything unexpected anymore. So you go into it with a plan that if this happens, this is what we do, and if this happens, that's what we do. If there's not a kitchen available, then we would bring a unit in to, to cook the meals for the shelter or have them shipped in to the shelter from wherever we can set the big equipment up. So we work with the cafeteria staff at the school, and they will make sure that the food is brought out, but we'll assist folks in actually getting served and directing them to where they can find and what they might need. Having a hot meal, having um, snacks is certainly important. Lunch is being provided by Feed More's Community Kitchen, and I've asked them to produce us a meal that would be typical of a disaster meal served in a shelter, okay? So it is probably not a menu that you'd select. So your first primary thing as a shelter worker is the care and safety of the people in that shelter, and that includes food safety. So knowing where the food came from and knowing that it's coming from the right place and how to serve it and serve it properly is key to providing that level of comfort and that level of security for those that are staying there. You have to have food from safe sources uh, and approved sources. Uh, you can't have family members cooking food or friends and then bringing it in. Uh, it's not a, an acceptable source of food. And we have to abide by the local health registration uh, regulations. We have uh, a little form that we use that we stick right here. It has the date, has the time, has the item, and the temperature. Now this is a Cambro. This is what the Red Cross furnishes us to put the food in. But that's a clamshell. Okay. It folds over. That's what we serve the, that's what the Red Cross serves the to-go meals to. These are liners that we put in here to put the food in. But we're going to have to um, work with the vendors because most people have different needs and desires when it comes to eating. And so to the best of our ability, we try to have a variety of, of meals. The important thing to remember is that if it's a dietary restriction, not a like or a dislike, that you need to work with your healthcare professionals to accommodate for that dietary restriction. And this is important to realize, is that we try to avoid anything that might create an allergic reaction. We try to avoid things that um, are red meat, because a lot of people don't eat red meat. You know, so we're trying to put pieces of those into our menu planning. The other key to feeding is to post your menus. You're not gonna be able to do that probably with the first meal because it happens so quickly, but for every meal after that, you're gonna wanna post what your menu is for the next meal. So people have the opportunity to go read it, look at it, and then they may not have identified that they're allergic to something that's now on the menu when they went through intake. It can be challenging sometimes with people wanting what they want. And people do want what they want. 
We are serving hundreds of people and that everyone has their own needs and we're trying to accommodate every single person. Just remember to keep calm and remind people that they are just as important as the next person, but we need to be able to handle everyone here. Food is love, and food is something that we that we tend to, um, you know, Thanksgiving, everybody gets around around food, and Christmas is around food. It's the same kind of thing in a shelter. There is an element of, of comfort in having the right foods there and, and being able to, to serve people and being able to, to receive something that, that is nourishing and, 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 uh, and good for them. This is an initial assessment intake form developed by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the American Red Cross. This helps us determine, do I send client A to be interviewed by the health department? It's nine simple questions, and any yes answer to any of these nine questions, we stop, and we send them to health services. Excuse me, is there any like, uh, any like pseudotide or anything? She's not feeling well right now. Oh, so she's not feeling, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. okay Miss Ernest, give me one moment. Let me get medical attention. Al, I need medical attention. Uh, so can, okay? we, can we call medical staff, please? She's a supervisor. Okay. No, I need, I need some. So in intake, a lot of the things that you have to look for is if somebody has an, an active disease that is apparent. Do you have medicine or anything that you have to have right away for your safety? Um, there's going to be wounds, there's going to be infectious disease, there might be STIs, there might be, you name it. There's going to be a lot of, of a whole panoply of, of stuff. We want to look for things like, is the person completely withdrawn, like not able to connect with that person at all? Uh, is the person um, super agitated or super excited? Uh, is the person really disorganized in their thinking or, or um, disoriented to where they don't know where they are, they don't. Those are all emergencies. In the event of a serious emergency, we're gonna ask that worker to be able to identify um, if this person is in uh, some type of crisis. And if they feel that it's necessary, they should separate this person from the rest of the group and then seek health services. I can't breathe. Just a second. Okay. Let me get someone from medical over here really quickly. Can I get someone from medical registration? It's going to be okay. They're going to come. They're going to help you. Hi. Thank you for bearing. Take some deep breaths. Go ahead. Three, two, look back. Breathe in. Three. Hold it. Because I am not medically inclined, anything that sends up a red flag to me that this may need someone's assistance outside of my realm of authority, I have someone available. I have a resource available that I can direct a citizen to. So if someone um, arrives at the shelter that has been severely injured or maybe they're in the shelter and they've become injured, you're going to have um, a health department resource that's gonna be in, in the shelter and they've been trained on first aid. So the first thing that I would do is try to uh, reach out to them and they'll triage among the other people that they have that might be sick or injured there. Unified Command Shift Supervisor, I need medical to the lobby at registration for a pregnant female that's having issues. Relayed to medical, she's eight and a half months in. She needs help, like... Do we have any known uh, problems with the pregnancy, any... There's not that we know of, but that'd be okay. Let's go ahead and move you back towards the medical table and we'll get you going from there. Triage in this in this instance is somebody that you're somebody presents yourself themselves to you. And you're kind of triaging what they're what they have that you can help with, which in a shelter situation is limited. First aid is kind of expected. It's important that especially if they are showing signs of a significant injury, that you immediately take them somewhere more confidential, 
get your health services representation and start having that conversation of, well, where does it hurt? You know, have those conversations with someone skilled, trained in that profession to deal with whatever the answer might be. She's having some nausea, okay. some heart palpitations, yeah. and some shortness of breath. Yeah. We just started just, about two minutes ago, yeah. and we just okay. got her down here as fast yeah. as possible. Yeah. Okay. So, let's do breaths. Okay. So, you're eight and a half months. Have you had any complications with this pregnancy? No. They are equipped. They have resources that they can call on if need be to meet the needs of the citizens at that particular time. If they have some type of durable medical need, whether it's um, you know oxygen generators or, or otherwise, we're going to flip over backwards to make sure that they have that. Um, with the caveat that we can't prescribe the medication on, as a clinic. We are not doing psychological assessments, we are not doing medical assessments, we are just keeping a status quo to people until they can get back to their homes or making sure that they can get back to a normal type of life. I'm not licensed to give medicine. That's not my purpose for being there. I'm there to shelter you, and if you need anything that's outside of my realm, we have a lot of people around to help us meet the needs. <laughs> the health side of things is, is a little bit more linear than it is for mental health. Um, you come in and you have a broken arm, that's, that's fairly linear. You go, you go, you get triaged, you go to the hospital. Mental health is, is quite another, unfortunately, because if you have somebody that is tremendously agitated, um, there tends to be a, a group dynamic or a group stress, if you will. There is no health without behavioral health, and behavioral health is very much health. Um, so they're not separate in reality, but depending on what the presenting issue is, it requires a different approach, a different tool to be used. Hi, how can I help? This is Lauren, she okay. needs to see the nurse. Okay, well, let's bring you back to right ahead, uh, right now, and we'll get you set up with the nurse right away, okay? Okay. Do you wanna come on in here? So you're gonna have people that come in that, that you're not gonna be able to manage as well as you think you are. Sometimes the people that walk in there are going to be unmanageable or, un, or unruly or whatever the case may be. And people will always be stressed. There will always be somebody that's upset because there's a lot of unknown. Oftentimes, to support behavioral health needs in disasters, we rely on volunteers. People that can either just receive some just-in-time training, or people like through the Health Department's Medical Reserve Corps that have volunteered for the mental health support function. Um, so it really just depends on what's that most immediate need and then you can start assessing from there. Going to a shelter is stressful, right? I mean, and, and going through a disaster or, or losing your housing, that's stressful for just about anybody. I know I would have a hard time with it. So just keep in mind that people are, you know, they're going through their own experiences, it's, it's what, their, what their reactions are, for the most part, in general, are, are normal. And what they may just need more than anything else um, at that time is just some human contact, somebody to talk to. It, it just, it really helps them to redirect and to kind of focus on something else. You've been having a hard time, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can't find my daughter. There are lots of, of shelters, so she's probably at another one. And what else have you been doing to take care of yourself while you've been here? Did you bring anything with you to entertain yourself, to distract you? I, I don't even know what I grabbed to come out of the house, honestly. One of the best things we can do when individuals are in shelter in situations in when we're ministering to their mental health is helping them regulate. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in a within a sheltering situation that is dysregulatory, that is doing the exact opposite of helping me feel safe and connected, of helping my body and my emotions be well-regulated. 
So there are tools that we can use, um, tools like having a safe space or a quiet room, a calming room. They go by a lot of different names, a resilience corner or a, a regulation station, um, things like that where we can have resources. And that might be being away from all the action and hubbub, being able to have those tools within the shelter and to be able to give that person space, to give that person comfort, to express our compassion and empathy to them. Um, and we can do those with tools like our voice tone and our body language a lot more than we can with our actual words because people in crisis don't hear the words that we say very well. They hear how we say it. You can come back down here anytime. We do have counseling services available if that's something you'd like. Okay. I'm sure much of this will be relieved when you yeah. come down here. Yeah, I'll find out where she is. Okay. okay. Sounds I good. appreciate your help. Absolutely. Every shelter staff member should know what mental health resources are available, whether that's, you know, telehealth or a phone call with somebody from the local mental health organization, whether that's someone who's sta stationed there in the building uh, to be a resource for them, whether that's someone who might not be a professional but still has expertise and skill. So when you are called to be the person to be in those situations, you walk into a thousand people that are displaced in a, in a large shelter. You might have some needs of your own and you might arrive there and be worried about your family or you might worry about your situation or you might worry that you're not able to do it. Take care of yourself first. We need to be able to ask for help. You're gonna have those wise and wonderful people who can you know, de-escalate anybody who are working in your shelter. And it's okay if you're not that person. We all have different roles and different hats that we wear and different skill sets that we have. Anyone Working for the Department of Social Services has a heart to want to serve, to want to give back to their community, and this is a way that we can do it. We're providing a service to people who don't have the comforts that we might be available to us, and so this is something that we can do to give back to the community. We need you. We need the whole you, and it's okay. Nobody expects you to come in here knowing everything. This is a learn-as-you-go situation because no emergency is the same. Communication is key. Um, if you don't know something, ask. You know, that's the thing about people, I believe, that work in social services. Their heart's in it. I don't care what kind of personality they have. Somewhere there's a heartfelt feeling in there to help. And at the end of the day, we know we've done exactly what we set out to do, which is to help someone that's in need and to make sure that we made a rough situation maybe a little bit better. Because the act of giving of yourself is a no-brainer gift and a smile and someone who just says, I'm here because I care and I care about you makes all the difference. So shelters scare everybody. Um, I was scared in my first shelter, and I'll tell you, honestly, even though I've been in 50, every shelter you still look at and go, ooh, what if this is the one? But once you get through your first client or two, you realize that you totally can do this, and really you've been getting ready for this your whole life. We have the opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. And one of the most important things to remember is you're not alone in this. You're never going to be alone in this. There are people who are here to support you as you and I support others. I know this is not where you want to be, but a lot of people need you right now. And you have a support system with you to help you meet the needs of the people that need us. Being in a shelter is probably the most rewarding thing you can do because you're helping the individual that cannot help themselves. And know that you can do this because you have the heart for it and you've been trained to do it. Pack your bag, because you may stay longer than you need, you thought. Um, come with an open heart, a willingness to help, and you will learn as you go. And you will have leaders in place that is going to direct you um, and to support you um, as you go through this process. 
I want to just remind you to put on that smile. Uh, walk into that environment like we're inviting people in. We're not rescuing people, but we're inviting people to be in our care for the next few days. Uh, be yourself. Um, know, know that you are doing good. Know that you are feeling other people or, or carrying other people when they can't carry themselves. Uh, thanks for taking the opportunity to be able to be a part of a community that you may or may not know, but that needs uh, someone to come alongside them and to prop them up at certain aspects, in a shelter, in feeding, in whatever it is uh, you might be doing. You're bringing something to that community to help it heal. You are gonna come out of it with the biggest heart, the biggest gratitude, that you were part of something in really important and that you were able to help even if it's one person even if you were able to help one person you're gonna love it for the rest of your life you're gonna be fine square your shoulders know that you can get through this we're all in this together breathe realize that this too shall pass and it's going to be okay you are never alone and you can do this so just take a moment take a deep breath Thank yourself for making this choice and let's get started.